Good morning. Oh, it's great to be here. It's nice to have a Sabbath at home uh, and uh, with traveling and doing all of the things that I have to do for work and then uh, sometimes, most of the time, traveling out for church. Uh, getting to sleep in on, uh, well, I didn't get to sleep in this morning, though. In fact, I, it's amazing when you're about to give a sermon how you don't sleep very well. Just try it sometime. Uh, but um, it's really great to, to be here. Uh, I am really ready for fall. How about you? This is so hot. Oh, this has been, it was really a pretty, pretty, pretty hard week, uh, heat-wise. And uh, looking at the long-range forecast, but we really need to pray for some rain and for some cooler temperatures. Um, and by the way, this will be an earlier feast. I did want to mention that, whoops, uh, the Holy Day schedule uh, looks like this. Feast of Trumpets, September the 10th, Day of Atonement, September the 19th, and then Feast of Tabernacles, and last great day, day is September the 24th through October 1. That's early uh, this year, it's early, so um, we may be wearing summer clothes for, for the feast this year, don't, know, don't really know, not sure, but um, uh, I wanted to, I wanted to um, just have a little bit of a moment here of a, an update. Uh, on 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 my health because uh, I want to ask for you guys' prayers uh, continuing. Uh, this week I've had, I believe it's nerve regeneration taking place in the face, and I get these um, little quiverings that go on here and in the eye, and you know I still have a droopy eye. So uh, would y'all pray for me <laughs> uh, that God would uh, restore this? You know, uh, uh, if I'm where I'm going to be, I'm happy. Uh, I'm very thankful, but. Uh, I would like the ringing in the ear to go away, and uh, when I turn, put my head down, I'd like to be able to see out of my right eye. So uh, there, are, there are some uh, residual things, uh, you know, other than that, and hey, it just takes time. And I am not young, uh, and, and when you fall and hit your head at 64, it may take a while. Uh, actually, I heard this week that it might take as long, if you get a bruise on the brain, as seven years for it to really clear up. So in that case, I'll never see that day, No. Uh, you know, there's, a, there's an interesting phenomena that takes place all around us today. Uh, it is an a epidemic, and the epidemic is spelled with four four-letter word. You know what it is? S-E-L-F. Self. Uh, that is an epidemic. And if you don't believe me, go to a library... Or to a bookstore, and you'll be amazed to see how many magazines and articles are available on the topic of self, such as self actualization, self analysis, self assertion, self awareness, self confidence, self control, self defense, self determination, self development, self discoveries, self enrichment, self esteem, self expression. A lot of that going on, right? Self-fulfillment, self-help, self-identity, self-image, self-improvement, self-indulgence, self-love, self-realization. That's enough. There's a lot more. There's a lot about self. And we are a very self-conscious society, aren't we? You ever notice that about uh, those things going on around you? Have you ever noticed that in yourself like I do? Uh, yeah, I, you know, we, we are all about self, I think, way too much. Uh, the baby boomer generation has been identified and called the me generation. The me generation. Um, I thought this might be f fun for us. Uh, it's probably not fun when you hear these, but we all know Jeff Foxworthy. Remember his little, uh, his little one-liners, you might be a redneck if, remember that? Well, let's, uh, let's look at this with the self. And you may, be, you may have a me addiction if... Uh, let's say in the last six months, and here are some of them. You may have a self, you know, a me addiction. If you have pulled into a parking space ahead of the retired guy in the white Buick with the, with the Texas license plates who has been waiting with his turn signal on while the other car pulled out. You may think I'm kidding, but that happened to me just recently. I'm waiting to pull in, and the car pulls out, and another car goes, Phew! Really? And that happens. 
Now, we also might uh, have the me addiction if we have sneaked into the express checkout line that says, you know, 10 items or less with a full go- grocery cart. You ever had that happen to you? Well, that is because somebody is thinking about self. Uh, you, might, you might have a me addiction if you have accepted credit from your boss for a job you know somebody else did. Hey, these things go on in life. I mean, these things are all around us. Um, and, you know, don't take offense at this. This is all a joke here. But you, you might have a me addiction if you felt a sigh of relief in knowing that you weren't as poorly dressed, ill-mannered, unimportant, unintelligent, or just plain tacky as all the self-centered sinners who were sitting around you this morning. <laughs> oh... It, this is just a self-centered world that we live in in society. And an unknown article uh, recently titled, How to Be Miserable, said it this way. It says, if you want to be miserable, think about yourself. If you want to be miserable, talk about yourself. If you want to be miserable, use I as often as possible. If you want to be miserable, expect, expect to be appreciated. Hmm. Wonder where that'll get you. Be suspicious, be jealous, be envious. Never forgive a criticism. And this is these are these are things that go on. Trust nobody but yourself. You ever heard that? Ever uh, experienced that? Uh, insist on insist on consideration and respect. I thought that was earned, right? Uh, demand agreement with now. Okay, now I'm, my wife has accused me of this one, so here it goes. Demand agreement with your own views on everything. <laughs> I might be that way at times, um, <clears throat> you know. And you do as little as possible for others. That's uh, that's another another cue that you might have a little bit of a self-centered nature. But you know, we are a very we live in a very self-conscious society. And we are so preoccupied with ourselves. And should we be surprised about that? Really? Turn with me over here to Timothy, 2 Timothy 3. Familiar scripture to us. Uh, I'm going to read it to you in the King James, and then I'm going to come back in one of the other versions and, uh, and read it to you. But it says here, we'll read the first five verses of uh, 2 Timothy 3. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, which means difficult, uh, dangerous Fierce. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. <laughs> hmm. Imagine that. Covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful and unholy. And if you think about all of those uh, things being mentioned there, that is all because of the way an individual looks at them. It's all self, about self. Without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. And then verse 5, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, says from such turn away. Now listen to this, this is in in one of the other uh, versions, listen to this narrative on these verses, because this is... To me, uh, you know, really puts it in a vernacular that we really could relate to. It says, don't be naive. There are difficult times ahead. As the end approaches, people are going to be self-absorbed, money-hungry, self-promoting, stuck-up, profane, contemptuous of, contemptuous of parents, crude, coarse, dog-eat-dog, unbending, slanderers, impulsively wild, savage, Cynical, treacherous, ruthless, <laughs> I like this one, bloated windbags, <laughs> addicted to lust and allergic to God. They'll make a show of religion, but behind the scenes, they're animals. Stay clear of these people. We live in this kind of world, don't we? Uh, hands up, agree? Is this where we are today? Yeah, it really is. And it's interesting, but in society today, there are three forms of expression uh, that kind of point to this and that can be identified. The three, of, the, three, uh, uh, the three points or the three items or the three things are, number one, 
individualism. Number two, secularism. And number three, narcissism. And you say, what? Who cares? Well, think about this just a little bit, though. Individualism is others don't matter, just me. That's what individualism is. Secularism is God doesn't matter. We know that people that have that viewpoint. And number three, narcissism. And that is, all that matters is me. All that matters is me. So, you know, here, here we have these three, uh, these three points, these three forms of self-concern. And, you know, individualism is, I've got to do what's best for me. We find that. The motto might go something like, do your own thing. Uh, we, I grew up in that from the 60s. You know, that was kind of the motto of the 60s. Do your own thing. You know, do what you want to do. Uh, the theme song of that might be, I did it my way. Remember, remember who sang that? Well, that's okay. You don't have to, don't have to say. Um, and, and, you know, it's amazing. People in our society today, are they more considerate now or, more, or rude? Well, I find people are rude and, and less considerate. As we are more self-absorbed and in that frame of mind, then, yeah, that tends to be the way it is. Uh, and if you don't believe me, just drive on the interstate. Have you ever been driving down the interstate and had a guy pull in front of you just to slow you down so he can make the exit off, right? I mean, you think, why can't he just pull in behind me and then exit it? Uh, you know, and... Or, if you're driving down the interstate and you might be going 76 in a 75 in the left lane and you about get run over and then when you pull over the guy's mad at you because you were in his way. I mean, these, truly, it's, it's really kind of the way it is. Uh, Proverbs 18.1 kind of says it this way, an unfriendly, man, an unfriendly man pursues selfish means or selfish ends. And he, devise, he defies all sound judgment. He's only thinking of himself. And is that the way we're supposed to be? Is that the way God wants us to be? Well, we know the answer is, of course not. It isn't that way. But then, you know, you think about secularism, which is that God doesn't matter. And, and for all of us, God matters most. That's the most important thing in our lives. But for some people, I don't believe that it, that it is that they don't believe in God <clears throat> They just think that he's maybe irrelevant. He just doesn't matter to them. I've met people like that, haven't you? And they won't deny that God exists, but they're just not interested in him. And you could say, well, it's because maybe they're not called. Man, that might be true, but uh, they ignore him. And the, there's, a, there's a mindset that they don't need God. Well, I'm telling you, I need him. <laughs> don't you? We all need him. Uh, and we need to be a lot less self-absorbed. Uh, turn with me over here to Job chapter 21. Job 21, just a, a couple of uh, verses here. Job 21. And verse 14 reads this way. Therefore they say to God, and I hope it isn't us that says this, Verse 14, Job 21. Therefore they say unto God, Depart from us, for we desire not the knowledge of your ways. Now, I, I will say, unfortunately at times, you know, we, we exhibit that kind of mindset and behavior ourselves by the things we do. And, you know, we put ourselves before God and His laws and things of that nature. But here it's talking about those that, that specifically deny God. You know, and you know the King, and the King James versions. For we, for we desire not the knowledge of your ways. Wow, how incredible that might be! They basically say to God, "You stay on your side of the fence; I'll stay on mine." And um, um, you know, you don't bother me, and I won't bother you. You handle the world, and I'll handle my life. Which is uh, that's sad. It's a sad way, but I'm telling you that is, uh, you know, if you think about. That this mindset about self. Who do you think the author is? Who was it that decided that he was going to t rise up and take over the throne of God? I will be like the most. I, 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 I. Well, it's obvious who that author is, right? We know who that is. We know that the author of the self mindset is comes from Satan and his minions. And they basically say... 
you know, God, I know better than you. I can make my own decisions. I don't need you. That's, a, that's, that's uh, you know, that's pretty serious. Uh, Psalms 10, Psalms 10, and verse 4 says, The wicked through the pride of his countenance will not seek after God. Notice that. The wicked through the pride of his countenance. That could be the pride of the way he thinks, the way he looks, the status that he has in life, whatever it is, but through the pride of it, he will not seek after God. God is not at all in his thoughts. How sad that is, and how sad that would be, especially when Proverbs 19.14 says that we should begin each day by saying, you know, you know, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight. I mean, we, we live by that. And, you know, we certainly don't want God to be far from us in that way. But, you know, we, is it possible that we can become so full of ourselves that we don't have room for God? Unfortunately, I, I believe that we can if we're not careful. Secularism and individualism basically says, I don't need God. I don't need other people. All I need is me. Don't cramp my style. And then there's narcissism. And you say, well, what is that? Well, narcissism is a, a mindset and a disease, I call it a disease, where uh, all that matters is me, where every, it, the individual's focus is always on themselves. Uh, all that I'm interested in, in is my goals, my dreams, my desires, my fulfillment, my, 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 my. Oh, my. So many mys in there. And, you know, what is it, what's in, the, what is, what's in there for me? What is in there for me? So, in our world today, we are very image conscious. And these three different mindsets uh, kind of label a lot of people and sometimes label us. And that's sad. So, you know, there's many magazines, and we know this, we see this all the time. There's many, many magazines that uh, focus on the physical things like plastic surgery, um, reduce certain parts, enlarge certain parts, because we want the outside to be beautiful, because that's what counts, isn't it? If I look good, then I must be good. And that's kind of the mindset, because all that matters is me. That's kind of the mindset. You know, and, uh, you know so <clears throat> what a sad way that it can be. And, you know, you ask yourselves with these preoccupations, uh, preoccupations that people might have in their mindset, what are the... What are the effects of this? What are the effects of this kind of mindset? You know, self-centeredness with individualism, individualism, secularism, and narcissism. Well, uh, a study, what we find is that we have disintegration, basically three things. Disintegration of families and marriages are taking place. Uh, we have a world full of superficial relationships that are not genuine. They're actually disingenuous. They're not real. They're kind of forced. And that brings about frustration and despair. And, you know, a study was done nationally in North America on the topic of, okay, get this, searching for your self-fulfillment, one of the things we mentioned earlier. And among the married people that they talked to and interviewed, um, those most devoted to their own development and self-development were those having the most trouble in their marriages. In fact, the result was 50 to 53% divorce. That's like one out of every two. Uh, that is kind of what the st statistic is today for marriages all across the board. Can you imagine that? 50%. 50%. And this article identif was identifying that because of self-centeredness and people were so focused on themselves that they were not doing the most important things, which was relationships, the relationships they had with others. So, you know, that's a... And the fact remains that when we 
Uh, have you ever heard, have you ever heard the, the, or here's a question for you. Who is the center of your universe? Me, right? Aren't we the center of our universe? I mean, we think that many times. Um, and the fact remains that when we make ourselves the center of the universe, which we're not, who is the center? God. God is the center. He should be. Uh, but the, the problem is when we're self-centered, then we think we are the center of the universe. And boy, what problems that brings. And the problem with that is we, we never can control all of our universe, can we? We just, we're out of control. And you see that, frankly, uh, in, in that we see that we need God. We see that we need a higher uh, power, a greater authority. We need a focus. We need the North Star. <laughs> we need God's guidance. And we need His compass to give us our li- give our lives meaning and significance. And, you know, it's not about us. Not about that. Uh, we... Turn with me over here to Proverbs chapter 22. I think it's a good time to read it. Proverbs chapter 22. I meant to read this as we started off, but I'm old. I forget things. Proverbs 22. Now, some of you are shaking your heads because you know I'm not as old as you. Okay? Proverbs 22 in verse 4 says, I don't want to spill this. There we go. By, notice this, Proverbs 22, 4. By humility and the fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life. Are you saying, are we reading here, that there are no self-made men? I mean, basically that's what it's saying. By humility and the fear of God, then all of these things come our way. We'll get into a little bit more of that. That, uh, you know, by humility and fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life. And again, the fact is when we make ourselves the center and when we think we're the ones that are doing everything and it's because of our wisdom and our greatness and, you know, what our college educations and that, you know, that makes us so smart when actually... There's nothing we do or have that we haven't received. And that ought to keep us humble. And, you know, humility. Humility is so important. Proverbs 28. Turn over there just a few more uh, chapters here to Proverbs 28. Uh, Verse 25. Uh, Probably this is the summation of the sermon. I ought to walk off the stage after reading this. Proverbs 20. 8, verse 25, he that is of a proud heart stirs up strife. A proud heart is one that's self-centered, one that is self-indulgent, that is, you know, all about him. But he that puts his trust in the Lord shall be made fat. I guess you know where we're going with the sermon, that we all need to be putting our trust in God. And so much less trust in ourselves, because we don't really matter. We don't really matter. And really the solution to um, getting rid of self-centeredness is that we think of others, that we become outward in our direction, not in here. We read that in Matthew 25, you know, where he talks about, uh, um, you you know, um, uh, as you've done it unto the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me because there's somebody out there that's looking after the weak and the poor and the, the naked. And guess what? That's outward. That takes effort. That's not inward. That is an outward direction. It's a very, very simple concept that we move from, it, from you know, the self-centeredness to being outward like that. But, you know, it's... I believe for for everybody here, for all of us, that it's important that we devote, that we devote ourselves to that. And that we actually take time to think about how self-centered we are and then find ways to get rid of that and become serving of others. Become ministers. We're all supposed to be ministers, which means servants. And if you're servants, you serve. And you're not self-serving, you're serving others. 
Uh, turn with me to here to Luke 22, and I, I just have to read this because these aren't, this isn't my thought. This is, these are the very words of Jesus Christ and how he was. Luke 22. And we read here in verse 24 through 27 that, you know, there was a strife, among, strife, here we go, another, a strife amongst the disciples, among them about which one would be the greatest. Well, if you're thinking about who's going to be the greatest, what are you doing? You're looking, you know, well, let's see, I'm this way and that way. You know, Peter could have said, well, I should be the chief apostle because I have the gift of gab and I can talk. Andrew would have probably, you know, couldn't have said much, but he was one of the twelve, but different gifts to different ones. But, you know, it's really funny, and which one of them should be accounted the greatest? And Jesus said unto them, that the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them. That is a mindset. And, you know, that's a, there are those that want to rule over, uh, dictate, be in charge, tell you how to do it. They, and they that exercise authority upon them are called benefactors. But he says, you know, talking to the disciples, to those who were saying, well, I wonder which one of us should be the greatest. Oh, it's me. No, it's me. No, it's me. He says, but shouldn't have that mindset. But you shall not be so, verse 26. But he that is greatest among you, let him be as the younger. And he that is chief as he that does serve. For whether is, which is greater, he that sits at meat or he that serves. Well, I mean, we think about that. Normally, it's he that sits at meat is, you know, is served by the... You know, the subservient. But look what Jesus says. Is it not he that sits at meat? Of course, that's logical. But look what Jesus says about himself. But I am among you as he that serves. He was not about, you know, he didn't care to come in and be the, you know, the king there in Jerusalem, you know, during the first century. He wasn't concerned about that. His only concern was that he was serving and taking care of everybody. They were tearing off roofs so that he could heal them, anoint them. You know, remember the woman that had the issue? He's walking down the road and she comes up and touches his garment. And he knew, you know, he's felt some virtue go out of him. And he was there to help her. And as much as we... Uh, want to be focused, self-focused on ourselves, the real important thing is that we be focused and that we take care of each other. Um, you know, there are basic needs in life. There's a basic need to be loved. There's a basic need for security. We all want those things. And there's also the need to have, we all feel this need that we need um, a sense of significance, that our life means something. But how do we go about that? How does that take place? Is it because then we, we you know, are self-serving and we do things that makes us feel good or that we are reaching out and doing those things that please God and therefore then He's pleased with us. And when we do that, then we have great significance in our lives in every way. The purpose of the church, one of the purposes of the church, is to build relationships We're building relationships with one another, but we're also building a relationship with God, aren't we? And with Jesus Christ. It's about building relationships. And that can't happen if we are self-absorbed, if all we're thinking about is how we feel and the way we look at things and our pitiful and poor circumstance. Paul was, you know, he said, I'm content in whatever state I'm in. And, you know, visiting, uh, it was so sweet yesterday uh, being able to visit uh, with Faye up in the hospital because here she is there with uh, COPD and, you know, her lungs sound horrible and she's, you know, not, uh, she, she lives with a horrible uh, disease. And, you know, that, you know, she is so sweet and so ready to go with whatever her lot is. And I really, really was moved by that and really appreciate that. And, you know, her focus is is really good. And our focus should be on taking care of others. Uh, in, in ex- we read this in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19, Ephesians two nineteen. It 
this is verse 19. Now therefore you are no more strangers and foreigners. You know, the church is a family. The body of Christ is a family. We're all members one of another. But fellow citizens with the saints, that's what we are. We are a family. We are fellow citizens. <laughs> We're all brothers and sisters in the body of Christ and, you know, what God is doing and what He's building. And of the household of God. You know what? We all need, we all need this. We all need church. We all need this family. God designed it that way. I mean, why would he have be started in Genesis and say, let us make man in our image and after our likeness? He has a purpose. It isn't that we go off and be by, be by ourselves. It isn't that we try to take over and do his job better. It isn't that at all. It's that we be a family. And it's that we be brothers and sisters, all heading in the same direction with love and care for each other. And, uh, you know, so he, he's very important. He's... We all need a place to go where we can become what God wants us to be, and that's right here. We all need to be here because this is the place where we learn to be what God wants us to be and how he wants us to be and how we are to relate to one another. I've often, this is a carnal thought that I've had, one of many, by the way, that I, want, I wish I lived would have lived back about 1850 and I was somewhere up in, you know, northern Colorado, Wyoming, Montana, way out there by myself. I don't know why I thought that. I just thought that would have been cool, I guess, you know. Wouldn't have had to put up with people. Wouldn't have had to put up with people. Guess what? We're called to deal with each other. Sorry, you have to put up with me. That's what our life is all about. And we're not low rangers. We have to have relationships. God has called us to that. And the best place to build the right kind of relationships is right here, right here in the church. We're encouraged over here in Hebrews. I love this, I love this verse, Hebrews, these verses, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23 through 25, which says, Let us hold fast the profession of our hope without wavering. Hold fast to what we believe, what we know. For he is faithful that promised. There isn't anything that God has promised that he hasn't fulfilled or he won't fulfill. He will fulfill everything he has promised. He is faithful. His word is good as gold. Actually, better. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. Notice that provoking is to love and good works, not to provoke each other. But to provoke unto love and good works. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. Unfortunately, that's the way it is. It's, you know, there are some who can't meet. I know that. But then there are those who can meet, but they don't. And they don't know what they're missing out on. They don't know how wonderful it is. But we're called to exhort one another. And so much the more as we see the day approaching. He's telling us, you know, don't give up on meeting. Don't give up on getting together we need to be together as much as we can as in this family as the days approach and you know what it isn't just good enough to attend that's not good enough that's good but it can be better we need to participate we need we need to be those who are involved we need to share we need to belong it is what God has put in us to do and what we're supposed to do and what we're supposed to be. We need to encourage one another. We just read that, those verses. You know, small groups like this are so valuable because we do get to know one another. We do get to, to uh, support each other and help each other. We all, we all get to cheer for Rebecca today. Very happy for her and for Jacob, who's heading down to Texas A&M, our young people. It's wonderful. We get to pray for each other and to encourage one another. And you know what? That's good. It's good for our own emotional health, and we need those kind of relationships. Okay, I'll say this to all of my wonderful brothers and sisters out there on the Internet. And I don't, 
if you have a place to meet, I'm encouraging you to meet. Because I don't believe just internet church is the best. I love internet church, you know, at times. I love to be able to look in. But boy, you miss out on so much when it's just internet church. You miss out on so much. Unfortunately, if all you have is internet church, now I I recognize to all of you out there that there are some of you who can't meet due to health, due to location, due to the fact there there isn't a church. By all means, have internet church because that is your church service. And for those who are on the internet church, and I've seen all of the chats, there's a lot of chat that goes on and there's a lot of fellowshipping and I think that's wonderful. But we have to be careful when we can meet, that we do meet, because if we don't, if we're just internet church, there is no commitment or involvement. No involvement. Not real involvement. And the reason is, is because... And, you know, as an introvert, this sometimes not interacting with people is really good. But if you're not careful, we won't interact with anybody. And that's not good. And part of, the, part of the benefits of church and why we're here is because we get the chance to interact with one another and with other people. So I believe that is the first antidote to, you know, counter self-centeredness and selfishness. The other part of this is I... I really believe that <clears throat> to be spiritually and emotionally healthy as individuals in the church, that we need some kind of form of service that we do. I don't know. It, that is up for you to, to decide how that takes place. Um, I heard a sermon once, I love this, of a, one of the ministers, I won't name a name, who used his Sundays to for the whole family to go mow the widow's yards. That's what he used. You know, that was uh, something they did, did on a, you know, a weekly basis. I know we sometimes have other things we can't do it every week, but what about that? What kind of ministry do you have? What kind of outreach? What kind of um, help do you give to those? What kind of volunteer service? You know, without anything in return. The Matthew 25 principle. There's actually 168 hours this coming week. And I know God doesn't want us to spend just all of our times on ourselves. How will we help others? I believe we need it and we need it for our health. And we need it to balance our (laughs) self-centeredness. That wants to just, let me go piddle in the garden. That's me. But there's lots of opportunities out there. Ephesians 2, Ephesians 2.10. And I can see I'm going to cut this way short. Ephesians 2.10. Says, for we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. You mean I'm not created to do my own works? And it's not all about me. <laughs> no, we are created unto good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. Each one of us here are created unto good works. And that is because we are His workmanship. That is what He is developing in each of us. Many people suffer with... Uh, <clears throat> Identity crisis, you know, who am I, what am I, where am I going, where did I come from, why am I here, why am I still here, (laughs) what am I supposed to do with my life? The answer is, long ago God planned that we should spend our lives helping others to be outward looking, outward reaching. We read this in Mark, chapter 8. And I know you can find lots of uh, scriptures to, you know, verify what we're talking about here today. But in Mark 8 and verse 35, and by the way, this is found in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You can find it in every one of the Gospels. 
this, this verse that I'm about to read, verse 35. You can, you can look it up. You can see them all. It says, For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels, the same shall save it. What are we willing to give up in service of others? What are we willing to give up? The world says, let's get all we can. Let's get all we can. But Christ says, give all you can. Give all you can. There's no really, I don't believe, any greater fulfillment than giving and helping others. Look at the life of Christ. Look at the life of the Apostle Paul, who was willing to to be in prison and in change and suffer hardship and shipwreck and beatings and all that. Why? Because it made him feel good? No. Because it was helping bring others to Christ. It was helping others. Be strong in the faith. That's what his life was all about. Philippians chapter 2 tells us, verse 4, Philippians 2 and verse 4, Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. When I first read this in the, you know, in the King James, look every man on... Uh, um, on every man on his look not every man on his own things but every man on the things of others it's like well is he saying that we're supposed to want to steal from others I mean, we're not to you know we're supposed to look no it isn't saying that at all it's it really is saying hey we better be paying attention to the needs of others to the needs of those around us that we should be sensitive and that we should be considerate and that we shouldn't pull into a parking space that if, you know, ahead of somebody that's right there in line. We ought to be considerate. And if we got a, gar- you know, a grocery cart full of groceries, don't go through the 10, exp- you know, 10 or less express aisle, please. But we have to be aware of what's going on. We have to pay attention to the needs. Hey, Attention to the needs of your husband and your wife and your children and your friends and your brothers and sisters right here. Uh, look, look out for their interests, not just you know, for our own, not just for our own. I do think we have to realize we are not the center of the universe. That you know, just because we may have a college education and we may be smart and may have you know, a Ph.D. piled higher and deeper that that isn't just because of our greatness. That is because we have received that from God. You realize even chromosomes and all that we... I look out here, everybody's different. Everybody has a a different appearance. Everybody has different intelligence. God gives that. God gives that. And we can't look at ourselves and say, well, look at me. God is the one, no matter where we stand, no matter how popular we might be, no matter how much education, no matter how much money we have, it is somebody else that has given us and allowed us the the means for getting that. It's God. It's God. Turn to Acts chapter 7. Acts 7. I'm sorry, verse at Acts 17. Acts 17. If we think we exist in the world we exist in with the intelligence and all that we have just because we're smart and good and bright and all that, think again here when we read what these verses say, beginning here in verse 24. Acts 17 says, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwells not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing that he gives to all life. That ought to humble us. 
Everything we have is because God gives it to us. And breath and all things. All comes from God. And is made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth. And has determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. That they should seek the Lord if happily they might find him. I hope all of us have found him. I hope all of us have been seeking him and are seeking him. And that we will acknowledge to him that without him (laughs) we are nothing. And it isn't about me. It's all about Him. It isn't about us. It's about He is and Christ are the center. And that He might... uh, Verse 27 again. That they should seek the Lord if happily they might feel after Him and find Him, though He be not far from every one of us. If we'll just look. If we'll just acknowledge it. He's there. If we will just get out of being so absorbed in ourselves that we take the time to, like David did, you know, continually talk and thank God for his involvement in his life. Verse 28, For in him we live and move and have our being. You mean it isn't about me? No, in him we live and move and have our being. As certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Everything that we have comes from God. That ought to really humble us. That ought to really make us stop and think about all the individualism that we're confronted with and the secular, secularism that we fight against and the all-about-me narcissism that can be parts of our personality if we're not careful. And I believe that if we will do what Proverbs 22.4 said, you know, which was, by humility and fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life, that if we will take this approach and that attitude, we will look out around us and we will see that we are what we are because of Him. And it isn't about us. We are what we are because of the grace of Almighty God. And I'm telling you, self-centeredness and selfishness is a curse from Satan the devil. But if we stand where we stand because we recognize it's because of the grace of God, when we finally, I believe, come to have this kind of attitude, this kind of mindset, then I do believe we can begin (laughs) to get our focus where it needs to be, which is off of being self-centered and focused on being God-centered. And may God bless each and every one of us in that endeavor as we seek to become like Him.